on. What we're going to be looking at this morning is a real quick run through the book of Job. Probably one of the most confusing books for people, but once I show you what's primarily teaching this morning, I think you're going to have a whole different appreciation for the book because it's really talking about faith. You hear about Job and the patience of Job, but the honest truth is Job wasn't very patient. He was getting frustrated with God because God wasn't giving answers that he wanted, and we'll get to that in just a little bit. I deliberately chose the, the picture that you have up there in front of you, uh, the skydivers, and there's an obvious reason for that. Uh, I have two daughters in Michigan, uh, both a number of years ago, I paid for both of them to go down south of Grand Rapids to take lessons in how to skydive, and when it finally came down to it, one went up and the other stayed on the ground. And I was talking about this the other day when we made the trip down to Cynthiana. And is it true? You've been skydiving, Kara? All right, so Joe and Darla and I have something in common. We both have daughters that are severely deficient somewhere. <laughs> Anybody that's going to get up in an airplane and jump out for no good reason. How many times have you done it? Once. That was enough? Was it a tandem jump or did you do the static line? Tandem. What they'll do, and, and my daughter Annie did the same thing, you're harnessed to a, an experienced skydiver and he or she will be behind you and then that person actually has the parachute, not you. And then, but the advantage to doing that is when you jump out of the airplane, how high were you when you jumped? Do you remember? I just saw a little square. <laughs> I know, yeah, and that was Chicago, that little tiny square. Uh, I think Annie told me that they were at around 12,000 feet when they jumped out of the plane. That's a long way up. If you do the tandem jump where you're jumping with somebody who's experienced, then you get to free fall for a long way. And I think they free fell from 12,000 down to somewhere around 6,000 feet. They've got an altimeter that lets them know how far they're dropping. And Annie said, the, the, and you, I know you noticed the same thing. She said, it's like there's no sensation of falling at all. Even though you're falling at about 120 miles an hour and the ground is coming up a whole lot faster than it looks like. Uh, but the other option was to do what's called a static line. With a static line, you're attached to a line. If you've ever watched any old war movies where the airborne jumps out, they have a static line. They get just clear of the plane, and the static line is only long enough that it pulls the ripcord and the chute comes up. You're better off, if you decide to do it, to go with, uh, to do it tandem. I, I would suggest this, don't do it at all. I don't know about you, but I just feel a whole lot safer when both feet are on the ground. Was there a moment when you did that, when you're getting ready to jump out, when you were thinking, I really don't want to do this? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what was it that made you jump? The guy pushed. He pushed. You, you didn't have any choice. <laughs> and he said, Emily is the older of my two daughters. They both took the class. Uh, and they showed them how they packed the chute, and I think you had to take like about a two-hour class ahead of time, if I remember correctly. And then it finally came time, okay, you ready to do this? And Annie, the younger of my two, the adventuresome one, said, oh yeah, I can't wait to get up there. And Emily said, no, I don't think I'm going to do this. Now, the reason I'm bringing that up is we're talking about faith, and in fact, what Annie and Kara did, as compared to what Emily did, kind of makes a point about this morning's message. Faith versus fear. Kara and Annie both exercised faith in somebody else who packed their shoe. And you were hoping that he knew what he was doing. And that when you jumped out of the airplane, he knew when to pull the ripcord. So she's putting an awful lot of faith in somebody else that she didn't really know. And Emily decided, no, I'm just not going to put that kind of faith in somebody, so I'm not going to jump. And this, believe it or not, this is what Job has a lot to talk about. It has to talk about the fact that faith is always accompanied by fear. Let's begin with a word of prayer, and then I'm going to read a couple of passages to you. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would bless this time this morning. We're going to be dealing with, in fact, it started this morning when we, even during the, the meditation time, Lord, we were talking about faith. When Kara sang, talking about faith. And the message, Lord, that you laid on my heart back several weeks ago 
has to do with faith. And so I can only assume that means today you want us all to be thinking about this matter of faith. Every single person here, Lord, who knows you as personal Savior has exercised faith, or he or she would not be a Christian right now. We had to give up depending on ourselves and depend wholly and entirely on you. And it's because of that we have eternal life. And Lord, for that we thank you. But then from that point forward, we're supposed to continue, Lord, to trust you more and more. And we find as we begin, to, uh, our faith begins to develop, we begin to kind of spread our wings. Lord, it can be just as difficult to trust you even as Christians as it was even before we became Christians. There's something that's holding us back. And so, Lord, I pray that we would think about these things this morning, that you would bless here, you would be with those that are making the trip right now to Branson, keep them safe, give them a good time of fellowship, a good time of relaxation and interest during the week, be with Megan and those working back there with the... Um, with the teens, and I pray, Lord, that this will be a time of learning for them as well. Bless this time as we lift you up. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. By the way, there is share care tonight, ladies, at 5 o'clock. Let me, let me put in a, um, just a kind of a plug for share care. You may or may not be aware of this, and we've been doing this now for about a year. Um, the current heroin epidemic, if we can use that term, actually began with what were known as pill mills back in the 1990s. It started with doctors that were prescribing opiates, uh, primarily uh, hydrocodone, oxycodone, and oxycontin. And that kind of developed an appetite on the part of people for the high, the euphoria they could get from it. But then they found out that it was getting more and more difficult to get it from the doctors. And it was more expensive to do that. And at the same time, there was a large group of Mexicans who came in from uh, one of the smallest states in Mexico, Nayara. And they started bringing in what's known as black tar heroin into the United States. And the ground zero for the heroin epidemic was Portsmouth, Ohio. And it spread out from there. Uh, it actually originally started in the San Fernando Valley in California, but what had happened was the ground had been laid here in the Midwest because of the incredible amounts of prescription medication that was, uh, was being prescribed to people, and in some cases, ridiculous, amount, ridiculous amounts, 1,500 pills a month. Nobody needed that. Um, and so what we... You, you talk to these that have been uh, part of ShareCare from the beginning. They're becoming experts in this. And what we're going to be looking at tonight is we're going back and we're starting to take a look at the whole pill mill revolution going back to the 1990s. In fact, I have an excellent video that I'm going to be showing tonight that kind of takes it back. It's dealing primarily with what was going on in Florida. But it was so similar to what's going on here because I'm working now part-time with the uh, Hamilton County coroner, Mayor there is, is over there full time. There is barely a shift that we work over there and I'll be working tonight uh, until eight o'clock tomorrow morning. And I can guarantee you right now that there will be at least one overdose tonight over in Cincinnati. And I'm not just talking about an overdose, I'm talking about somebody over there is going to die that's alive right now. And so what we're dealing with is serious, but here's the point that I've been trying to make for the last year. What we're dealing with is spiritual more than it's anything else. And that is the things, and that's what I've been trying to show them, trying to teach them, and they get it. And so now they have the ability to be able to pass that on to other people. Anybody is welcome to join us at 5 o'clock this afternoon. We do, normally don't have a really big crowd, so we meet back in my office. If we have to move it, then we'll move it. All right. Let's talk now about faith. Give me, if you would, Bill or Geneva, the next slide, please. The foundational underlying principle of the Christian life is this. The just shall live by faith. And that's the blank that you have there in your bulletin if you have that. The just shall live by faith. The first place that that shows up in Scripture is back in the Old Testament in the book of Habakkuk. And the Old Testament prophet said, and the just shall live by his faith. And then Paul picked up on that in the book of Romans. Twice he says, the just shall live by faith. In the book of Galatians he says, the just shall live by faith. Now you ask any Christian, are you living by faith? And I think that he or she would say, yes I am. And I would say that's true. 
And I can tell you this, after having been a Christian for better than, uh, let's see, about 33 years now, uh, even though I grew up in church, I didn't become a Christian until I was in my mid-30s, I've learned to trust the Lord a whole lot more now than I was trusting Him back in the mid-1980s when I first became a Christian. Think about this. I have, well, I have four children. One is with the Lord right now. Actually, I have five because you didn't know it. I've adopted you. Uh, Kara is my number three daughter because I've been praying her through this, this whole thing with Merritt. I forgot to mention that to you. Uh, don't worry. We don't have to support her. Uh, but I have been praying for her since she's been going through nursing school because I want to see her make it through that. I'm not sure I want her taking care of me one of these days, but I want to see her make it through there. I, I told you already, anybody that would jump out of a perfectly good airplane there's something missing up here and if I'm in the hospital I don't I'm not sure I want that person taking care of me the just shall live by faith that means that what we're learning to do is to put our dependence and reliance in the Lord now the foundational principle is the just shall live by faith guess what is the most difficult thing to do in the Christian life to live by faith. Now all of us understand this. When I, I remember hearing this a number of years ago. When kids are growing up they think that mom and dad are the smartest people on the face of the earth and then they get to where they're somewhere around in their middle teenage years and they start to wonder now about mom and dad. You know they're starting to feel their oats and they're starting to think that they know better than mom and dad. And then they start into the workforce, or they go off to college, and then they come back after the first six months, and they're sure now that mom and dad don't know anything. And then about two or three years into it, they know everything. And then about the time they hit about 22, 23, they're amazed in how much mom and dad have learned in the last four or five years. Because they're starting to realize that mom and dad were right all along. Here is something that we have to be convinced of. God is right, and you and I are wrong. God knows how we ought to live. You and I do not. And so we come into the Christian life, we've been programmed by the world, we've been taught by the world how to live. And we feel very comfortable with that because that's what we've had modeled for us our entire lives. And then all of a sudden we become a Christian and we hear from a message that Mike is preaching or something that we read in the Bible, something that we hear maybe on some television preacher or something. And we say, wait, 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 I can't do that. Let me give you an example. A number of years ago, when I was pastoring up in Michigan, we had, uh, we had started a, a school that was a ministry of the church. We had, I think, about 79 students at our peak. And I was teaching part-time in the school, and I was teaching uh, English. And uh, I remember the day, his name was uh, Travis. Travis was a trip, I'll tell you. And he made the statement, he said, yeah, last night he said, we had some friends that come over. No, no, he, I, he said, yeah, I seen him. And I said, no, you didn't. He said, yeah, I did. I said, no, you saw him. He said, you saw him too? I said, no, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. Travis is not correct to say, I seen him. You say, I saw him. And he got this really funny expression on his face and he said, huh? But Travis did that anytime you tried to teach him anything. But it's the same thing for us is we start, we begin to learn God's word we run up against things in God's word and we get this funny expression. We think, what? That can't be right. And I'll guarantee you that every single one Christian here this morning has at one time or another in your life since you've become a Christian and probably far more than once, you have discovered something from God's Word, you've had something pointed out from God's Word, and you realize that what God's Word says is not what you've been doing. Amen. But that's what God's Word says, and God is right, and I'm wrong. So here's what a lot of Christians do. I need to pray about that. I, I can see that. I need to pray about that. I need to pray about whether or not God's right and I'm wrong. Try this. Well, you can't really try it right now. Uh, imagine this. Those of us that are parents, you know what I'm talking about here. You can, you can kind of remember this. Let's say 
that you give a son or daughter something to do and say, this is exactly what I want you to do. Now, do you understand the instructions? I want you to do this. When you get home this afternoon, I want you to do this. And I want you to make sure this is done. And your son or daughter says, I'll pray about it. <laughs> if I had pulled that with my dad, well, I wouldn't have even thought about pulling that with my dad. Because dad would have said, there's no need to pray about it because I've given you very clear instruction. You know exactly what it is I've told you to do. Don't pray about it. Do it. But let's take that and let's carry that over to the Christian life. I've studied and I've discovered something from God's Word. And God's Word says you need to stop doing this or you need to start doing this. And I'm going to try to spiritualize it by saying, well, I, I realize I need to think about that. And I need to pray about that. And while God doesn't speak up maybe like a, an earthly father would, God would essentially say, don't pray about it. Do what I've shown, it is, shown you it is you need to do. Now, to do what God says is to act in faith. I am trusting that God is right and that I'm wrong. That's why we have to be convinced of that. God is right and I'm wrong. Now, I told you we're going to look at Job this morning. I'm only going to read a couple of brief passages right here, but let me give you the story up front if you're not familiar with it, or maybe I'll kind of, this will serve to refresh your memory when we're talking about it. Job, if we go to chapter one, we find out that Job was the godliest man in all the East. What's really interesting about Job is it's like God takes the curtain and he pulls the curtain back and he lets us see what's going on in reality behind the scenes. So it says that the sons of God had come before God. And one of those was Satan, who was originally Lucifer, cherub. We all know who Satan is. And so God says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job that there's nobody like him in all the earth? And Satan said, well, sure. You build a hedge around him. He said, I can't get to him. You've blessed everything that he does. Tell you what, this is Satan speaking to God. I'll tell you what, you take away that hedge and you let me get to him and we'll see if he doesn't curse you to your face. And God said, all right, I'm going to let you do that. I'm going to pull back the hedge just a bit and I'm going to let you get to him. You can touch his possessions, but one thing you cannot do is you cannot touch Job himself. So it says Satan went out. Now here's what happened the next day. Within a matter of minutes, Job gets a couple of different reports. Number one, he has several of his servants running in, and it turned out that uh, his servants out with the, with the camels, with the donkeys, with the sheep, had been attacked from marauding bands, and they had, Job had lost everything. In a matter of about 10 minutes, picture that, Job finds out that he has lost everything that he owns. And then another servant comes running in and says, I got some really bad news for you. He said, but you know how your sons and daughters would get together and they were meeting in the house of uh, one of your sons and a huge wind came from the east. It toppled the house, crushed your children. All 10 of your children are dead. Now give me the next screen and I'm going to show you what Job said in the face of this. Job chapter 1 verse 22. Job did not curse God. It says in all of this. In all of what? He'd lost all of his possessions. He had lost all of his children. I, I can't, I've lost one child. I can't imagine what it would be like to have 10 children and lose all of them at the same time. That, that's just me on comprehension. In all of this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. He didn't accuse God of being unfair. He didn't accuse God of being unjust. And then, the next day, or sometime later, the sons of God are coming before God again. And here's Satan again in heaven. By the way, Satan's not in hell. I know what the cartoons show. Scripture says Satan is the prince of the power of the air. He is the God or the prince of this present earth. He is free. And he is, he, and his primary power against us is he has the ability to deceive us. And the wisest thing that you and I can do is not listen to him, not listen to our own flesh, but listen to God. So the sons of God are coming before God again. And God said, what do you think about Job? 
He said, I let you take everything he has. I let you kill his children. And he hasn't cursed me. And Satan said, yeah. But you touch a man's life. He'll curse you to your face. And God said, all right, here's what I'm going to let you do. Do whatever it is you want to do with him, except you cannot take his life. So Satan said, gotcha. Satan went back out, and we read that the next thing that happened to Job is that Job was struck with boils from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. Now, if you've ever had one, or if you've ever had shingles, you can picture what it was like for Job. Job was in such misery that it said Job went outside of the city where they had where they burned the trash and there was hot ash off to the side. And it says that Job sat down in the hot ash. He picked up a broken piece of pottery and he started to scrape himself just to get some relief. I remember a number of years ago I had some sort of a, an allergic reaction to Gain detergent. That's what it was. And it started, I think, here. And it worked all the way down to my ankles. And it was finally all the way up here. And I was, I was red. If anybody's ever had an allergic reaction, you know what I'm talking about. And it felt so good just to scratch myself like that. And, no, and you couldn't scratch yourself enough. And it didn't hurt to do it. It felt wonderful to keep on scratching yourself. And then I finally realized I was starting to cut myself and I was starting to bleed. And my wife said, don't you think it would be a good idea now to go to the doctor? So I went to the doctor and he said, what in the world did you wait so long for? Here, let me give you this. We gave him some, I don't know, cortisone injection or something like that. Within two days, it was completely gone. Um, guys, trust your wives. Have faith in your wives. They usually know when it comes to something like that better than we do. All right. Now, Job is now reduced to utter despair. If I could have the next screen, here's what Job says. Job's wife comes to him and says, why don't you just curse God and die? But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Now that's pretty remarkable. When you think of everything that Job has suffered, Job refused to blame God. Job refused to curse God. And when his wife suggested that he do that, because what they believed was that if you curse God, that God would automatically kill you. By the way, there are a lot of people that still think that. God is not looking to kill us. Even when we're talking about the wicked. God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. No more so than if, if, if my children had said something about, Daddy, I hate you. Now that would have bothered me, but I would know that it's coming from a child. And when you and I speak foolishly against God, God's looking from an entirely different perspective than you and I do. God is our Heavenly Father, who does no wrong. God always does right. And God looks down at us and he sees children that don't understand. And so God doesn't get angry with us. God just works to try to change us and to help us to grow and to mature. Now think about this. Job had lost his possessions. Job had lost his children. Job has now lost the support of his wife. And then as we continue to read Job, we're not even going to take the time to do that because you can skip through most of the book of Job because it's a conversation between him and his friends. And I'll say this about his friends. With friends like that, you don't need any, any enemies. But the problem that his friends had was the same problem that Job had. They had a false idea of who God is and what God is like. And so they were saying, well, God's doing this because your heart is not right. And if you would just repent and get your life straightened out, then God would turn everything around. And so Job argues back and forth with his friends. And they never did come to any kind of an agreement. But the thing that you want to remember about Job is this. He's reduced to utter despair. He has not yet cursed God. But I'll guarantee you that Job was completely confused and perplexed. Why in the world are you doing this to me? And he asked God that in different ways several times as you continue through the book. But why? If you just give me an opportunity and let me address you face to face and present my case, if you just listen to me and then explain to me or show me why it is you're allowing this to happen to me. And if you read the book of Job, you kind of wonder the same thing. 
If God really loved Job, why in the world would God put, some, put Job through what he put him through? Lost his possessions, lost his children, he's lost the support of his wife, and you'll see that he basically loses his friends. But then here is the real key. And this is what's going on. Finally, Job loses sense that God is just and that God is good. Now that's scary. If you take away from me my understanding that God is always going to do right, then I'm going to really be confused. I had somebody recently ask me, this is a question that comes up a lot, Mike, I know you've read this question a lot of times. Many of you probably tried to answer this before. Well, you Christians say that you have to trust Jesus Christ in order to be able to go to heaven. But what about all these people, the aborigines that lived in, uh, in Australia? Or what about people that lived in, in tribes and nobody ever talked to them and they never came to them with the gospel? They've never even heard the name of Jesus. What are they going to do? Are you going to tell me that God is going to send them to hell? I can tell you this. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except through me. Yeah, but that's not fair. How can you get to the Father if you've never even heard about the Father? And here's what I fall back on, and here's where faith comes in. God had come to Abraham and told him that he was going to destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah in the plain, and Abraham said, why in the world would you do something like that? Lot is down there, down there with his family. What about all the innocent children down there? And then Abraham made this statement. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Now, I don't have an answer for that question. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave that in the hands of the God that created those people. And I am convinced of this beyond any, anything, that God will do right. And how he's going to work that out, I don't have the vaguest idea. But I do know this. I do know that Jesus Christ is my Savior. I do know that that Bible I have up there, and what we're talking about right now is the Word of God. I do know that God is right and that I'm wrong. And I do know what God has given me to do, and I'm not going to worry about somebody that lived 300 years ago in the outback. All I have to worry about is what God expects out of Jerry Sewell here and now. And this is where the faith comes in. In those three verses, we just see everything that happened to Job. Now, there's one more that I want you to see. The next screen, please. I think there might be two here. Job is speaking. He's speaking now to his friends. My sighing comes before I eat. My groanings pour out like water. Now, you got to get this. Because the thing that I greatly, what does it say? Feared has come upon me. And what I dreaded has happened to me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, for trouble comes. Job was about as comfortable as a person could have been at that time. Had incredible possessions. Had a large family. He was well known in the city. He was known for his wisdom. He was known for the fact that he had helped people that needed help, took care of them. So Job had a good reputation too. But behind all of this, and to everybody, it looked like Job was a man of faith. Job was a man who trusted God. And in fact, God even praised Job himself. But behind all of this was the truth that Job was afraid. What was he afraid of? He was afraid God was going to take away everything that he had. He was afraid that he might lose his children. In fact, we know from chapter 1 that every day Job would offer sacrifices on behalf of his children. He said, it might be that they've said or done something wrong, and so I'm going to make sure that they're covered. And Job was afraid of losing all of those things. Here's what those things are, and this is, this is what's so important. And all of us have these things. These are the supports that allow us to function every day. When I lost my wife, Linda, and she and I had known each other since we were freshmen in high school, I feel like God just took me and split me right down the middle and took half away. For the longest time, I didn't even know how to function on my own. 
And, and I, I realize there are some guys that can do that, and I'm obviously not one of the ones that can do that. But God graciously, almost two years later, brought merit into my life. And what happened was that she again filled the place. And so, to, to a greater extent than she realizes, merit is one of my supports. I've got some other supports up in Michigan. I have Emily and my son-in-law, Kurt, and my granddaughters, Ren and Paige. And I can't get up there often enough, and I can't get up there as much as I'd like to to be able to see them. One of the rough things about being gone is that you don't get to see your family grow up. Isn't that true? I come in here. I'll be here tomorrow morning. i got to work all night, so be, be kind to me. But just knowing that I have a place to come to work and that I have a place of service, that's one of the supports in my life. You know what else is really important to me? Is my health. I've always worked really hard at taking care of my health. So did he. And what happened? God allowed him to have a heart attack. Now, Mike, and I know this from talk, I've known Mike now for, well, for probably about seven years, eight years, something like that, since Merritt was over at Floral Hills. And I know that Mike used to be the biggest kid in class. Remember the bully that always used to pick on you? Right there. He used to work out with weights. Big, strong guy. And I used to be a state trooper, used to work out with weights all the time. I actually used to look fairly decent. I don't think I was ever as big as you are. Didn't you weigh around 250 pounds at your peak? No, 280. 280? Here, here's what you do with somebody like Mike. This is my friend right here. You, you want to do everything that you can to win him over because you don't want him to get mad at you. But, but Mike is one of my supports. My position here at this church is one of my supports. Now, if you, and, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I'm afraid of losing my health. I'm afraid of losing my possessions. I lost a son. I lost my oldest granddaughter. And I'm scared to death that God might allow it to happen again. And I pray frequently that God wouldn't allow that to happen. I lost my wife. I pray that God wouldn't allow me to use a second one. She's assured me that if I keep acting the way that I do, I'll be going a long time before she will. <laughs> but we're trying to work that out. One of the, in the, the next uh, screen that we have up here, faith is always accompanied by a measure of fear. And that's certainly true about Job. I want to finish up here pretty quickly here. Keep in mind that Job was one of the godliest men of his generation, probably a contemporary of Abraham, somewhere right around the same time. God did not allow Job to be so severely tested because God was angry with Job. God allowed Job to be tested because God was pleased with Job. But he did not want Job to remain where he was. My daughters are now 38, 36, 28, 29. Really? Boy, I missed your last birthday. Here's Tom, who's going to be 20, 22 today. Happy, happy birthday to you. How about that? But I can remember when Tom was eight. And we, we were living out in Montana at the time, and uh, we allowed him up on the, the lawn tractor. And he was mowing grass. And he looked over at us, and we were standing up on the porch, and Tom was waving like this. And I remember Tom was going toward the garage, and he looked over and said, Hi, Mom! And right about that time, he just slammed right into the side of the barn. Now, I can tolerate that in an eight-year-old. But I don't want you doing that now. <laughs> when you get behind the wheel of that truck, you make sure that you're paying attention to other traffic out there. Don't be saying, hi, Dad. Hi, Mom. Of course, now he says, hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. Voices have changed. God takes us where we are when he first saves us. <laughs> How else can he take us? You are what you are. But a mistake that Christians make is they think that, well, that's, I'm a Christian now, I'm okay, and that's just the way that I am. 
And God does not want us to continue to be just the way that we were when we were spiritually immature. He wants us to grow. He wants us to mature. And that's exactly what he was doing with Job. He was pleased with the progress Job had made. He was pleased with Job of his servant. And he said, I want you to be even better. But Job, I'm going to knock all the supports out from under you until you learn to trust me. And your faith is in me and not in your possessions, not in your children, not in your wife, and not in your friend. And the last, I think it's the last one right here, an essential part of the process of sanctification that's being set apart from the world to God is that God uses the circumstances of life to teach us to trust him. And then one last slide, if you would. Here's what God didn't do. He did not give Job the answer that he wanted. Here's what Job wanted. Tell me why you're doing this. Here was God's answer. Job, I'm going to show you who I am. Job, I'm going to teach you things about me that you never imagined before. He said, I want you to look at the world around you. He said, I made that. He said, Job, I want you to look up in the sky and I want you to see. I don't know if you've ever been out. Uh, I remember I used to drive across the big hole out in Montana. A couple of times I would stop at like 2 o'clock in the morning where there's absolutely no city lights for 200 miles. And I would stop and get out of the car, shut off the car, shut, or my truck, shut off the lights. And I would stand there and look at the sky. Unless you've ever been out in a place like that, away from city lights, you've never seen what's up there. And God said this to Job. I know every single one of them by name. Job, I made everything. Can you do that? And Job bowed his head and said, no. Trust me, Job. Let me have your life. Trust me. And that's exactly what God asks of each of us today. You may not understand what I'm doing. Trust me. You may not understand why you're going through the trials and the difficulties that you're facing right now. Trust me. You may not understand why you've lost your job. I've been there. God says, trust me. You may not understand why this has happened to you. Trust me. Get to know me. And the more that you get to know me, the more that you will be able to trust me. And then as we grow to know God, God drives out the fear. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us to take the lesson that we've had this morning from your word. Lord, that we would think about it. Think about why you allowed Job to go through all the trials and the testing that he did. Lord, this is given for our instruction. But I pray, Lord, that it won't be necessary for us to have to go through anything approaching that, anything nearly as severe as that, but that, Lord, we might get to know you better and better so that we can trust you more and more. Let us not forget this. This is what your word teaches. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.